In this video, a husband and wife found themselves stranded in the cold Oregon wilderness with their two young children, with no phone signal and little hope. This is the Kim family ordeal. Our story begins in November of 2006 in the beautiful city of San Francisco. Famous for its steep rolling hills and Golden Gate Bridge, San Francisco was home to a 35-year-old man named James Kim. Now James, he lived in a cozy house in the heart of the city with his wife Katie, along with their two children, four-year-old Penelope and seven-month-old Sabine. Son of Spencer Kim, a wealthy CEO of an aerospace company, James was born and raised in Louisville, Kentucky, graduating with a double major in government and English from Oberlin College of Ohio in 1993. He was described as talented, an expert multitasker, extremely caring, thoughtful, and sweet. When he was 27, he met the love of his life, Katie, and fell madly in love. After leaving college, James worked various jobs, but his real passion was technology which would later lead him to taking a job doing product reviews for a now defunct international cable network, Tech TV. This gadget is jam packed with preloaded samples and loops. Or you can even make your own on the fly. That's pretty wicked. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. You could also record off the FM radio or transfer sound files over USB with a PC. Now he did these reviews for a while before he bagged himself a dream job at CNET, an American media website writing product reviews. And I'm James Kim. So life was going amazingly for James and his family. He had a job that he loved, he owned two shops with his wife Katie in San Francisco, and they were just living the American dream. Until Thanksgiving of 2006. On Friday, November the 17th, James and his wife Katie, along with his two children, made their way to Seattle in their silver Saab station wagon. They intended to spend Thanksgiving with James's auntie and uncle. They made it there safely and had a fantastic time. One week later, the family packed their bags and left for another road trip from Seattle to Portland, Oregon. When they got to Portland, they met an old friend for brunch before stopping at a hotel for the night. The next day, on Saturday the 25th of November 2006, the family left for Tutu Tun Lodge a resort located near Gold Beach, Oregon. Here they planned to stay the night. The weather that day as they traveled was rainy and quite cold, but this wouldn't stop them. And eventually they stopped for dinner at Denny's in Roseburg, Oregon. They tucked into their delicious Denny's meal before returning to the road at approximately 9 p.m. As they left, James would snap a photo from the diner window, a shot that in hindsight captures their last family meal together. From Denny's, they planned on driving west on Highway 42 to the coast and then south on US 101 to Gold Beach. It was around a three hour drive. After driving all day, they soon started to get tired. While driving on the Interstate 5, in the dark and the rain, they missed their turn off to Oregon Route 42. This was the main route to Gold Beach Despite missing their turning, they thought, nope, not gonna panic, and they checked their paper map for alternate routes. This is when they spotted a small secondary route along Bear Camp Road that skirted the Wild Rogue Wilderness, a desolate wilderness area of southwestern Oregon. While the map did read not all roads may be suitable in all conditions, they didn't think too much of it and took the subsequent turning down to Bear Camp Road. Unbeknownst to the family, in the winter it does not get ploughed and does not get maintained. As the family drove along this alternate route, with only the headlights illuminating the way forward, the rain slowly mixed into snow, and the temperature began to plummet. In the dark, they passed three sizeable yellow warning signs that read, Bear Camp Road may be blocked by snowdrifts. While they did see these, again they did not heed the warning and continued on. Driving along Bear Camp Road, they pushed and pushed for miles. 
and there was nothing. The pair just hoped and believed that on the next turn there would be a motel or a gas station, but obviously there wasn't. They had yet to learn that they were driving to the edge of nowhere. Driving aimlessly in the snow, they soon came to this turn off. At this point, they were entirely disoriented. Checking the map, it looked like the correct road, so they took the turning. They followed this road for miles and miles too, but it seemed it was just taking them higher into the mountains. The moderate snow had now turned into a full-blown blizzard, making visibility very poor. This is when they came to another pitch in the road, one leading up and one leading down. It was here they had to decide to go to the left, up, or to the right, down. Comparing the two roads in the dark, the one to the left looked steeper and less wide, while the one to the right looked larger, less steep, and better paved. There was also a large metal gate on the right road that was wide open. Thinking that this gate must indicate the correct route, they eventually settled on the road to the right. Unfortunately, because of the blizzard, they did not see a sign confirming that the left road was indeed the correct road to the coast, and that the right road led to a dead end. This was also indicated by the road markings, but these were not seen as they too were covered in snow. To make things even worse, the large metal gate should have been kept closed to prevent people from going down. However, that winter, it was left open for hunters to access. Traveling beyond the open gate, the road quickly got steeper and steeper and tighter and tighter. Snow and ice on the road made it extremely hard to navigate, even for 4x4 vehicles, let alone the Saab station wagon that they traveled in. The road quickly turned so tight that there was no way to turn around. At this point, James's wife, Katie, grabbed her phone and tried to contact her family for help. But upon doing so, she realized that there was no signal. The phone was about as good as a paperweight. As their two children cried in the back seats, dread began to build. They followed this tight, winding road for as long as they possibly could, hoping and praying that someone would be there to help them, or that they'd come in range of a mobile phone signal. But they were now in the middle of the wilderness and completely alone. After driving for what felt like forever, they now had no idea where they were. Realizing this, James and Katie decided that their best option would be to reverse out. James put the car in reverse and slammed on the accelerator. With the door open, James did his best to reverse down the tight winding road. He did this for hours, but it never seemed to end. Sadly, at 2 a.m., the Saab could go no further. Their cell phones still did not work and they were now almost out of gas. They decided to bunker down for the night. The family huddled together and hoped that the weather would improve by morning. On Sunday the 26th, the sun rose over the beautiful Oregon mountains and the family got out to stretch their legs. There was nothing but trees in all directions. James and Katie soon realized that they'd made a terrible mistake taking the alternate route. It was bitterly cold and the car had barely any gas left. To make it even worse, throughout the night it had snowed so heavily that the car was now completely stuck. They rummaged through their supplies and found that they had a couple of lighters, a pack of baby crackers, a few snacks, and a couple of jars of baby food. While it was something, it wasn't much. They had no idea how long they'd now be stuck there. So they instantly set on rationing these supplies between four-year-old Penelope and seven-month-old Sabine. On that first morning, the sun shone. However, it was short-lived. Another blizzard soon hit them and forced the family to stay inside the car, turning the engine on every 15 minutes to keep them warm. When darkness settled, the family huddled together for warmth in the back seat, but this is when they began to see movements in the darkness. When they turned on their headlights, they were shocked to see bears circling the car. James would pip the horn throughout the night to scare them away. The next day, on Monday the 27th, again, the weather was terrible. The snow was coming down hard and the wind was howling. 
To pass the time, they played games in the car and ate snacks. As they were expected back in San Francisco Monday night, they were confident that someone would come and find them. That evening, friends back home began to worry. The following day, on Tuesday the 28th, the blizzard continued all day, and the family experienced a third day in a row completely trapped in the car. On Wednesday the 29th, the blizzard finally let up, and the family could stretch their legs. James and Katie melted snow for drinking water and forage for berries in the wilderness, while the kids rationed the remaining crackers and baby food. However, out of fear of being poisoned, James and Katie were forced to stop eating the berries and instead starve. On the 30th, after four days of being trapped in a hostile, bitter environment, the car finally ran out of gas, meaning their only heat source was gone. That day, they turned to burning magazines that they found in the vehicle and any wood that was dry enough to provide heat. On the 30th, multiple colleagues started to become concerned as James had not turned up to work. His colleagues filed a missing persons report and this would begin the largest and most extensive search and rescue job in Oregon's history. After discovering that the family had used their credit card at Denny's, local police, state police, and more than 80 civilians, the Oregon Army, the National Guard, and several helicopters, three hired by James's father, began to scour the wilderness. They could find no sign of them whatsoever. James's dad also organized 18 care packages for his son and his family, strategically dropping them along the general search area. Each one contained vital supplies such as food, warm clothing, and last but not least, a heartfelt personal note from his father, telling him to hold on and that help was on the way. With the helicopters flying overhead, desperately searching for them, the days seemed to drag like hell. By Friday, December the 1st, they were all now freezing, dehydrated and starving. Out of desperation, Katie breastfed seven-month-old Sabine and four-year-old Penelope. That Friday, James took all four tires off the car and set them on fire. While the heat was excellent, sadly the tires didn't burn for long. By that afternoon, they had completely gone out. James and Katie began to prepare for the worst. On Saturday, December the 2nd, almost one week into this horrible nightmare, they had no supplies left whatsoever. The kids had gone quiet and pale, and they knew they had to do something. James and Katie checked the map, and it looked like the town of Galice was four miles away. James believed that he could make it to the town and call for help. At approximately 7.45 a.m., James set out into the bitter cold, wearing tennis shoes, light clothing, and a jacket. Carrying only a flashlight, two lighters, along with his backpack containing miscellaneous items and his identification. He told Katie that he would return by 1 p.m. that same day if he did not find anyone. However, by nightfall, James did not return. They had no idea that they'd read the map wrong. The town of Galice was in fact 15 miles away. As James set off into the snow, hundreds of people in rescue teams canvassed the terrain on land and air, determined to find the family. But the search area was so vast, after days of searching, not a single sign of them was found. On December the 2nd, search and rescue teams finally made a breakthrough. Two engineers from Oregon discovered a faint phone signal from James's cell phone from November the 26th. By using state-of-the-art computer software, they were able to narrow the search area exponentially, narrowing it down to Bear Camp Road. Two days after James had left for help, he had still not turned up. This is when a volunteer, unrelated to the official search teams, hopped in his helicopter to see if he could spot anything. And by a miracle, he did. In the air, the pilot spotted James's markings in the snow. He followed these and suddenly spotted something moving in the trees. Upon focusing on this, he realized that it was a woman waving a bright umbrella and to the right, he could read a large message stomped in the snow, reading, out of gas, SOS. After being stranded in the car for nine days, they were finally found. 
Rescuers approached the car and Katie broke down. She was so elated to be rescued, but when she asked about James's condition, assuming that he'd turned up at a local town, they had no idea where he was. Katie's heart instantly sank. She pleaded with them to continue searching. Despite what they'd been through, they were in decent health, suffering from starvation and light frostbite. After calling in their location, the trio were airlifted to hospital. Rescue teams now focused their efforts on finding James. Upon leaving the car, James trekked back through the snow for 11 miles before, for an unknown reason, decided to leave the road and traipsed down through the dense shrubbery towards an extremely steep ravine below. As rescue teams searched through the wilderness, they started to come across footsteps in the snow. They then started to come across small pieces of torn clothing and baby toys. A blue girl's skirt and pieces of an Oregon state map that were sort of cut up. And these, according to the information I have, were sort of placed again with our belief that little signs are being left by James for anyone that may be trying to find him. They really believed that he was alive at this point. Sadly, they soon discovered that they were searching in vain. At approximately 12.03 on the 6th of December, air rescue teams spotted a body lying in the water. And upon further investigation, it turned out it was James. He was found lying on his back in Big Windy Creek with his backpack still on in two feet of icy water. He had trekked a whopping 16 miles before his body ultimately gave in. It's estimated he died from exposure just two days after leaving the car. He was found just a mile from Black Bar Lodge, a fully stocked bar that would have saved him. With this discovery, the Kim family ordeal came to a brutally tragic end. This was heartbreaking for Katie. While she and her children had made it, her beloved husband had not, leaving two young girls without their father. This was also devastating news for rescue teams who fully believed that they'd find him alive. It's crazy to think that if that gate had been locked that night, this would have never happened. On February the 18th, 2007, to honor James's legacy, a memorial service was held for James at Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. Hundreds of people attended to pay their respects to the man who sacrificed everything to save his family. By the end of 2007, his friends and family established the James Kim Technology Foundation, which focused on providing San Francisco public schools access to technologies similar to ones that James had reviewed daily for CNET. But that is the end of the video. This one was just tragic. The thought of being trapped in an alien environment with no supplies, with your two young children, it just does not bear thinking about. I think the family did a fantastic job given the circumstances, but it's just tragic that James lost his life. What he did was honorable and selfless, and may he rest in peace. Do let me know what you thought in the comments below. As always, if you're into this kind of content and you're not subscribed, go and smash that subscribe button now. But I will see you guys in the next one. Bye-bye.